Thank you, John. Can people hear me all right? Because I have the audacity to wear a lapel mic inspired by my precursor today. Uh, before I start my formal talk, I just want to make a, a plug for my university. It's a very new one. It's called Humane Society University, and we started offering degrees in 2009. And um, I have these nice brochures. There's a bunch of them up at the front. Uh, I do not want to take them home with me. So please don't be shy about taking one. And you can also have a, a, a bookmark as well. We're the first university uh, to offer degree programs that are uh, entirely in the context of animal protection. Animal protection is a common thread of all of our uh, course and degree offerings. I, I didn't ask if there's a remote. Is that what this is? Great. Clearly it is. OK, um, I need to start my watch. Sentience is the bedrock of ethics. The foundation for moral systems is that other individuals have lives that matter, days that can go well, days that can go poorly. We may debate where we draw the line on sentience, but some animals clearly fall above this line. And by the way, the evidence is now very robust that we should certainly include fishes and I would say all vertebrates in the circle of sentient organisms. A series of experiments published in this book, 2010, or summarized in this book that came out just a couple of years ago, very clearly shows that fishes uh, have the equipment to feel pain and thereby probably also pleasure, and that they act and behave consistently with what we would expect from not just the registering of a noxious stimulus, but the experience of pain. And we often assume that we are the most sentient of all animals, and th there's no real powerful reason to assume that that's the case. Uh, th we, there's no strong s basis for su suggesting, for instance, that a mouse's pain is, is any less real to the mouse than a human's pain to the human. Of course, we have the challenge of these are private experiences, and we don't, we're not able to share those experiences. But we've curiously had a great emphasis on pain in our discussion of sentience, what discussion has been, animal sentience, very little discussion of pleasure. Uh, I know of at least 23 scholarly journals published in the English language that are dedicated to the study of pain. In fact, the word pain is in the title of the journal. And you can guess how many journals there are that are interested in the opposite side, the experience of pleasure. There's an obscure journal called the Journal of Happiness Studies, which I think <coughs> has gone in and out of publication over the years. What a curious thing, given that pleasure is such a fundamental part of our lives. It informs so many of the decisions we make, uh, not just our hobbies and our entertainment, but our careers, what we have for breakfast, the kind of clothes we decide to wear that day. So I find it a very curious um, contrast that we've had such an interest in pain and suffering and negative experiences and so, so relatively little interest in another part of life, which is so fundamental to quality of life. And we have uh, a bit one of the most influential philosophies, utilitarianism. Pleasure is very much a part of that dynamic. So it's not as if we've ignored it philosophically, but the application to our discussions and thinking about everyday life has been really wanting when it comes to pleasure. And there's some reasons why we may have that f favoritism towards pain. Pain is more easily recognized. And I think it's safe to say that in most cases, pain is more urgent. It's more urgent a need to end pain than it is to secure uh, pleasure. A, a, pain, a, a source of pain that is ignored by an animal may, may result in the ultimate penalty of death, whereas a, a, a missed pleasure can be retrieved later. But can we always assume that pain trumps pleasure? in moral importance. As you can probably guess from the title of my talk, I'm here to argue that that's not always the case. And specifically, in the harm of death, I'm arguing, I'm going to argue that uh, pleasure is far more important than pain. Before I make that argument, which is sort of towards the end of my talk, I, I want to quickly go through some of the arguments and the evidence for animal pleasure. Uh, when I set out to write my book, uh, Pleasurable Kingdom, and now I can publicly Finally, thank Mary Midgley for a very nice, nice uh, comment on that book when it came out. Um, when I set out to write that book, I wrote it because, because of this incredible dichotomy, this incredible lack of discussion and discourse about positive experiences, not just in humans, but especially in, in non-human animals. So I feel like even though perhaps most people in the room don't need convincing that uh, we're not the only 
experiences of, of pleasure, not to mention pain, I think it helps to make some arguments just to sort of lay the groundwork for why we should expect that we humans are not the only pleasure seekers in the world. First, um, the evolution, oh sorry, these are just some arguments that are summarized in, in these two books which John mentioned in the introduction. First, pleasure is adaptive. Uh, the way I like to put it is just as pain is nature's way of punishing maladaptive behaviors, behaviors that, that risk um, injury or death or making you somehow less fit to pass on your genes to the next generation. And by the way, if you've read any of those Darwin Awards books, you'll know that people can be quite creative about coming up with ways of removing themselves from the gene pool. <laughs> uh, similarly, pleasure is nature's way of rewarding good behaviors, encouraging and motivating behaviors that tend to promote survival and procreation. Another argument for basis for animal pleasure is that we, we don't question that at least one species experiences pleasure, we experience it ourselves, even though ultimately and dogmatically our experience of pleasures and pains is no less private than another species. We, can't, we, can, we can empathically say, I feel your pain, but we can't actually experience the physical pain of another. We accept it carte blanche as we should. We have the extra benefit of being able to make verbal reports of how we're feeling. Other animals certainly communicate how they're feeling, and it's pretty easy to recognize, uh, but we've been very loath, especially science tends to be the last one to sort of catch on to what's going on sometimes because of our dogmatism. Uh, science has been very loath and reluctant to embrace <laughs> animals' experiences. Fortunately, that is changing. And we have a, a rich language that describes both physical and emotional, uh, psychological types of pleasures. And one may say that perhaps um, some of these may be unique. That's this back to this unique, uniqueness question that came up in Dr. Midgley's lecture. Uh, some of these may be just the, the sole province of humans. It's possible, but it, we should also be very open to the idea that because other animals have sensory systems that we don't have, the capacity to, to, to uh, recognize the earth magnetic fields, for instance, to communicate with electricity, to echolocate, uh, we should be open to the possibility that other animals ha have the capacity for certain types of pleasures and perhaps also pains that we don't. Uh, so we shouldn't be too anthropocentric in our uh, view of sensory experiences pleasurable or painful. Third, we, we, don't really, we don't really doubt any, anymore, thank goodness, that other animals feel pain. And, we, and plants can illustrate that very nicely. Plants have been exploiting animals' capacity for pain for some time because it behooves a plant to keep most of their food, their vegetation, on the plant. And so that's, this is one example of how they, they have evolved to do that. Uh, but there's also fairly rigorous, um, somewhat elegant, if not necessarily ethical studies to demonstrate the uh, capacity for uh, pain in animals. For example, chickens and rats, when um, sub experimentally subjected to a painful stimulus, such as injected with a, um, with a, a, a compound that tends to bring on arthritic-type symptoms, if you give them the choice between unadulterated water and water that is adulterated with a painkiller, they very quickly learn to associate the painkiller water with the relief of their pain. As the symptoms go away, they will switch back to the unadulterated water. There is a penalty for drinking the painkiller water. It has a bitter taste, yet they will nevertheless drink that. They will take that penalty because it relieves the symptoms of pain that they have. I think it's a, it's a pretty clear demonstration of flexible behavior to relieve pain in a non-human. And finally, and I'll go into some detail here, animals behave pleasurably. This is Ben again. I don't know if there's a laser pointer on here, but you may be able to see this ball this filthy tennis ball just above Ben there in the picture. And like any optimistic dog, he's off and running before the ball uh, gets there. And by the way, 83-year-old Elaine here would tire out much sooner than Ben would. He, he was a seven-year-old and very energetic, and he'd be leaping up and down while she uh, walked off the field a few minutes later. Uh, animals love to play, and play is the least controversial of the types of behaviors that animals uh, show that appear pleasurable, or I would say that are pleasurable. And food is another very fundamental basis for pleasure. No one in this room needs convincing that food is a great source of pleasure to us humans. And once again, plants can offer a nice illustration of the role of food in, uh, in, in pleasure. And it's a plant's way of, in this, now in this case, ex exploiting, if you will, animals' capacity for pleasure. Wh what's it about? How does it work? Well, Technically, fruit is a, is a seed dispersal mechanism. Some plants rely on wind to blow the seeds away from the parent plant where they don't have to compete for, with the parent for light and nutrients and water. 
and some plants rely, have relied on uh, animals for um, the seeds sticking to their fur or they stick to our clothes and we pluck them off later and drop them somewhere else and that's exactly what the plant wanted us to do because we moved the seeds away. Well, fruit is just another way to do that. It attracts and it's all about luring and allurement and attraction and reward. Uh, fruit has bright colors, a nice smell, a uh, delicious taste and a big, huge nutritional punch to it. So it's the plant's uh, lure, lure to bring in a mobile organism, an animal, to grab the fruit, maybe eat it there, uh, maybe carry it away. But either in, a, in any case, if the, if the animal eats the plant there, the, some of the seeds are going to survive, and some seeds actually need to pass through the digestive tract of, a, of an animal before they can pro properly germinate. So well honed is the uh, coevolutionary bargain struck between plants and animals in the case of fruit. And then the animal... Um, deposits the seed later in a very convenient package of fertilizer. It's a, it's a lovely system that works very nicely. And it's all mediated by pleasure, by reward, by the experience of good feelings. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't do to talk about animal pleasure with it, with, with, and skipping over sex, so I, I thought I should mention it. Um, if, you, if you notice, you may notice actually these are, these are not a cow and a bull. This is not a bull mounting a cow. It's a cow mounting a cow and, and perhaps um, there's, there's more social dynamics here than sexual dynamics, although the behavior is, is, is un, unmistakably sexual <coughs> in, in its appearance. Um, but really the point here, it, though, is that animals engage in a great deal of, despite what the nature documentaries will make you think if you, if you watch them, uh, sex in animals is often much more than perfunctory and passionless. Animals engage in a great range of uh, sexual behavior that is manifestly not going to result in the production of offspring, same-sex pairings, uh, inappropriate penetration of different body parts, uh, self-stimulation, you get the idea. Some of the most arresting examples of animal pleasure occur in the realm of touch. And uh, this is one example. This is a hippo in, a in Africa, and hippos go into these freshwater springs in parts of Africa, and fishes of various species come and cluster around from various parts of the spring, and they uh, nibble away at bits of vegetation and sloughing skin. The fish, it's a mutualism. The fish get food, parasites uh, they can get, and, and such, uh, algae, and the hippos get a spa treatment, and sometimes they'll drift off to into, a, into a blissful sleep. This is a warthog, same idea on land, in this case, uh, getting um, a spa treatment from mongooses who enjoy the little nutritional reward, and the warthogs will solicit this behavior uh, from them, and uh, you can see it on YouTube as well. Uh, I don't have a slide of fishes doing it, but fishes do this on coral reefs where there's cleaner client stations, and it's mutually beneficial, but pleasure is the driver, or appears to be the driver of these behaviors. Comfort is very important for survival, too. If we're, if we're hot, it behooves us to get cool, and our body says, ah, that feels good, That's, it's comfortable. Similarly, if we're cold, uh, it feels good to, to get warm. And uh, these chickens are illustrating this. Uh, they've been in the barn all night, and someone's just opened the barn door, and they're sunbathing, <coughs> exposing parts of their body to the warm sun. You won't find the word love in most biology textbooks, but um, we should expect that species that require a great deal of parental care probably feel feelings what, like what we would call love towards their young. And there's no reason why these feelings cannot cross the species barrier. Aesthetic pleasure, no one, as far as I know, has really investigated this, but uh, I would be surprised if a peahen didn't get some kind of aesthetic thrill from seeing a peacock uh, like this, as, as we get a thrill. Perhaps she gets more of a thrill. And finally, the ineffable experience of freedom. Perhaps animals don't reflect on their freedom, although I would suspect when they're in a terrible captive situation, they probably do, especially if they've experienced it. But certainly, the um, experience of being free, I think, is very important and fundamental, and certainly the denial of it is a negative and therefore, perhaps, possessing it is part of the pleasure of life. So those are sort of summaries of how animals can experience pleasure. And just another comment about science in general. Scientists are now asking questions about animals' experience that they weren't asking before. Uh, we now know, for instance, that baboon mothers uh, show physiological and behavioral changes in response to the loss of a young, of an infant, that mirror those of women. Good glucocorticoid hormones go up for a month and gradually subside. And they also expand their social networks by engaging in therapeutic behavior, grooming in this case. Starlings, caged birds become pessimistic, and stimulated birds in enriched environments become optimistic. Pessimism and optimism are not words we, we would have we been applying to animals 30 years ago, and now we are. And these studies, I think, undermine a common assumption we make about animals, which is that they sort of live in the moment. Uh, things like bereavement and optimism and pessimism are long-term feelings that are experienced over uh, days, weeks, months. 
So it's as if their lives, it's not as if they're a series of snapshots. They play out like a, a film, if you like. So animals are individuals, and uh, they have not just biology, but they also have biographies. And I think we need to understand that. We need to recognize that. They are, in the words of American philosopher Tom Reagan, subject of a life. So what are the implications, the moral implications of pleasure? Well, it means that it, life's just not about avoiding pain. It, it means including this whole other end of the spectrum, these positive experiences. So it expands the breadth of sentience that the, that the animal is, is party to. Uh, it means also that one has a quality of life and that life has intrinsic value, not just, not just uh, utilitarian value to someone else. Oh, the cow's useful to me because I can milk the cow for the milk and that's good for me. But the cow is, has value to herself because she has a calf, for instance, that hopefully she gets to keep and can, and can nurse, and that probably brings her pleasures because of the emotional attachment, etc. And of course, it means that life is worth living. So we speak of the pain of death, but is, is death, is the harm of death really about pain, first and foremost? Uh, consider an anonymous death, uh, somebody who, who has no friends and relatives. This is the kind of thing philosophers like to, to pose, you know, and, and it's an, a pristinely humane death. The, the victim dies immediately, doesn't even know it's happening. Uh, is there anything wrong with that? I think most of us, if we, if, we, if we decide, if we realize that, say, you're the victim, you're the one who 10 minutes from now you will just be snuffed out and you won't know it's happening, of course, if you have the chance to reflect on it ahead of time, you will object most strenuously to that. And we have this, uh, there's probably a reason why we have this, uh, this sort of exhortation to, to not kill. Uh, the <coughs> harm of death is a very serious harm, of harm but I'm, I'm suggesting that it's not the pain of death because even a painless death, it, we, most of us would consider to be a great harm to the victim and it's the rewards of life, it's the pleasures that makes death terribly harmful. And that animals are pleasure seekers and not merely pain avoiders means that they too have a stake in their lives because animals are real and their pleasure's real. Their rich sentience exacerbates humankind's enormous toll on animals. And we're talking a very enormous toll. This is the estimated number, 60 billion of sentient vertebrate terrestrial animals, not counting fishes, which should be included, that humans kill every year. In America alone, where I live, we kill a, a staggering 300 chickens every second. It's easy to forget that every one of those chickens uh, is a unique individual. And it's important to remember that um, we each have a choice in how we relate to animals. And because 98% of the animals we kill are to be eaten, I think it's uh, really important to keep that as, that, that's kind of why I'm emphasizing that point here with this cartoon. That's where the rubber meets the road in the, our relationship with animals and killing animals. It's the whole thing about what we choose to eat. So to finish up then, um, animals have lives worth living, animals have pleasure, and because of that, um, it's the pleasures of life. Uh, I'm not actually making the case that pleasure is always more important than pain and moral issues. I think pain overall, probably on, 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 in the end of the day, is, is more important. But in the harm of death, uh, it's pleasure, it's the loss of future pleasures that makes death terribly harmful, and that's why that needs to be pleasure, animal pleasure needs to be very much part of our discourse about our moral relationship to animals. Thank you very much. <laughs>